Um, so Piaget came up with four basic phases, and then you'll see that the sensory motor phase, which is birth to 24 months, is, is broken down into even more smaller phases, right? And I think we've already mentioned that um, the, those first couple of years, you change so much. And so that's why you see um, smaller stages in the early years because it, there's just such a broad difference um, within the small groups of months and not years. So sensory motor stage is birth to 24 months. Um, and then in this stage, they're really learning um, how they can interact with the environment. And so they know what belongs to them. So if I try to move, I'm going to move me, but I can't like ESP, the thing that's over there, the little shaker, I have to grab that to be able to move it. Um, so they're able to interact with objects, they're able to interact with other people. Um, they start to learn object permanence um, which is their ability to know that, um, you know, if I can't see it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So it's just, it could be out of sight, but it still exists. Um, they start being able to make predictions, um, and that's really important, especially for reach and grasp, as we'll talk about in later chapters. So the first sub-stage of the sensory motor phase of cognitive development is exercise of reflexes. Um, and so this is going to be your first, um, really the first three months is where you see a lot of these reflexes. Um, and then after three months, um, they start to fade out, but you'll see um, these early reflexes up to one year. And they're just reflexes or involuntary movements. So there's a stimulus that causes an action. It's not um, caused necessarily by the child and it's, it's really we'll, we have a whole chapter on reflexes so we'll talk about that more later so as they're reacting to stimuli they're learning by trial and error um, and through the repetition of those reflexes how to move uh, the next sub stage is primary circular reactions and so you're going to see um, the, the reflexes start to phase out, so the voluntary movement, so I'm choosing to move, um, reaching for objects, um, trying to hold their head up, trying to roll over, those kinds of things. They also start to um, touch um, themselves, and so they're like using their hands, they touch their face, they touch their toes, they'll put things in their mouth, everything goes in their mouth, including themselves. Um, secondary circular reactions. So primary circular reactions you can think about as involving myself, right? So my central circle is me. And then secondary circular reactions when I am how me interacts with something else. So extending my circle. And so now you can see they're reaching for objects and not only just reaching for them, but able to grasp them and, and manipulate them in a certain way. Um, they're making faces at people and seeing you know their people's reactions they copycat a lot so this is where it starts being you have to be cautious of the words you use around kids uh, the next sub stage is secondary schemata um, and this is where object permanence comes into play so later on in that year you'll start to see and this is a big milestone that they'll they'll check with the pediatrician they want to know the kid is developing this. This is one of the big things they're looking for to make sure the cognitive development is on track. So you should be able to see if I, um, peekaboo is a good game for this. So if I cover up my face, um, the kid doesn't freak out because they, they know when I open my hands, I'm still there. Um, and they'll play it with themselves. Um, you can like hide their stuffed toy under a blanket and see if they still, um, if they know to look under the blanket to find it. So this is my kid and we were trying this. She was probably about six or seven months old. So you can see the phone is still behind the bear, but from her perspective, the bear was totally covering it and she knows to, so smart. to go for the phone and move the bear out of the way. 
So that means choose to vote object permanence. Um, also in this stage, they're learning how to, to move. So locomotion can be crawling, creeping, and walking. Um, their you know, trial and error, so as they reach for things and it does, they reach the object, then they know to continue that action that way. And if they don't reach the object, then they know to try it a different way. Um, they're trying to move, to roll over, they're trying to figure out how to kick to start crawling. And so um, all of that is really a trial and error process. Uh, and tertiary circular reactions, so we're extending our circle out more and not only just imitating adults, but recognizing that adults can help us reach things that we can't reach and um, feed us. And, um, and so they start getting more vocal during this stage because they're able to start to learn to communicate to get help from the adults around them. Um, also, the importance of being able to delay activity, which means if I, um, if they get an object that they know they can throw, so if they get, like in this picture, she has a little Easter egg, just because she has the Easter egg and it's fun to throw it doesn't mean she has to throw it right that second. So she could wait a little while and then go throw it in the basket instead of just throwing it down. Uh, and then the last sub-stage of the sensory motor phase is, um, is the invention of new means through mental calculations. I don't know why they couldn't come up with a shorter title for this stage. It's just one of those things. Um, and so now they're learning that um, objects have properties, and so they know, like, this makes this sound, and this is hard, and this is soft, and um, understanding all of those things. They don't have to do something to understand what it does. So again, along with delaying action in the example before where just because she had the Easter egg doesn't mean she has to throw it. She can wait until it, it until she gets to the basket to throw it down. They also don't have to throw it at all to know that it's capable of being thrown. Um, she doesn't have to throw a bouncy ball to know that it will bounce. She, can, she understands that um, and can think through that mentally. Okay, so that's the sensory motor stage. So the next big stage is the pre-operational stage. This is between two and seven years of age. So look at, we're getting at a broader scope um, because development slows down a little bit. Um, and so in this phase, we're gonna see um, their ability to be creative and to use their imagination and not everything has to be presented to them to be able to play. Um, language is a big, big component of this phase. So they're able to talk and communicate and form sentences and paragraphs and, and ask for what they want and, and think deeply and have conversations. And so um, you can imagine that that's not only affecting their cognitive development, but also their social development. And so all of that interacts with motor development. Um, and also in, in pre-operational, they should be walking by now, and really that should have started in the sensory motor stage. Um, but if they're not walking by two years old, then we, we should be really concerned about the motor development. Um, the biggest downfall of the pre-operational stage is this thing called egocentricism, which means they're still really just concerned about themselves. And um, they're not necessarily worried about what's going on. Um, with someone else. They're not worried about what someone else wants or what someone else thinks. Um, it's all about me and serving what I want. Um, in the, there is a couple of sub-stages in this, and so the preconceptual sub-stage, um, they're, again, like pretend play, um, but they really don't understand causality, and so, um, this could be a problem for for play and play with others because something happens and they blame it on the other person and it may not be anything to do with the other kid that happened to be innocently playing there um they just they just don't understand they know it's broken i didn't break it so it must be you so 
again, imagine that cognitive development, um, so their ability to imagine and pretend reflects how much they play and the ways that they play, and play is usually very motor driven when they're younger, and then their ability to understand causality and be able to communicate affects their ability to play with others and play with others well, which is social development. And then the intuitive substage, so um, they're learning bigger words, more vocabulary, um, and then starting to become more um, understanding of others' perspectives. And this may be where they decide, okay, you don't have to play what I want to play all the time. We can take turns or we can think about, you know, thinking, I don't always have to be the cop. You don't always have to be the robber. We can switch every once in a while. Um, but in this substage, so then we're we're not we haven't really met conservation yet, and so that's a really big deciding factor between um, this phase and the next major phase of Piaget's theory. So in the concrete operational stage, this is where uh, you're going to acquire conservation, and so. Conservation is knowing that just because we change the shape of an object, that its mass is still the same. So if you think about playing with Play-Doh is a big thing with young kids, right? Everybody likes to play with Play-Doh and everybody likes the cool little gadgets that come with Play-Doh to make it into all kinds of foods or, or sport things or stamps or whatever. They create some awesome things. So. If you think about like in the picture here, here's a ball of Play-Doh. If we put it into a into the little squeeze thing that's squeezing out spaghetti-like strips, it's the same amount, right? The, the amount of Play-Doh didn't change because we changed the shape of it. And so ability to know that is conservation. So a kid that would tell you that this ball of Play-Doh is heavier than the squiggle of Play-Doh doesn't understand conservation, so they wouldn't meet the concrete operational stage. They would still be in the previous stage. So by seven to 11 years of age, this is mostly, um, think about elementary school, and these are really, if you think about your elementary school math, this is what you are learning. Um, you're learning how to do math in your head, you're learning conservation, you're learning Seriation. Seriation is the main thing I remember from elementary school. I have no idea why, but it was the most fun, I guess. And so seriation is knowing that shapes that are different sizes or different colors are similar. Right? These are all triangles. They're all the same kind of triangle, just some are different sizes and some are different colors. And so then sorting them by size, sorting them by color um, is all part of seriation. Um, in concrete operational, they're also able to, starting to be able to develop strategy. So thinking about, you might see kids in the backyard um, with their flag football game, that they're actually thinking about plays instead of just everybody trying to score individually. And so um, they understand that there's roles in a team and that, you know, working together is big on performance. Mental modification, um, for example, if say that these two rectangles were a tube, right, and so we're going to send these three balls through the tube to the other side. So if we do that with the orange ball going first, yellow ball going second, and the white ball going third, through the tube to the other side, then which one is going to be the first one to come back? Right, and so if I didn't show you this, you would still know that because the white ball was the last one to come out, that it would be the first one to go back through if we didn't change the order. So the ability to do that is mental modification. So being able to, without seeing it, without drawing it out, think about in your mind how it's going to work. So then we get to formal operational, and this is the last stage that PJ talks about, um, and this is where we're starting adolescence. And then this is kind of like the mountain of motor development where not everybody's going to acquire the last stage, the most skillful stage, and because um, this really involves more abstract thinking. 
and more uh, reasoning skills. And so this is something that is, is probably going to require more education and a little bit higher IQ. And so we're not going to, not everybody is necessarily going to be able to do all of these things. So um, in formal operational, if you think about um, in concrete operational, we're talking about the kids were in the back being able to think about a play and plan their movement together as a team. So everybody having a role and figure out how they're going to be successful and get the touchdown. Right. So in formal operational, it's not just thinking about one play. It's understanding um, this play is going to get me this far down the field likely and then knowing what um, and now I'm going to have to do this play to get the next rest of the way down the field. So evaluating the second and third wave of effects. So what's going to be, I'm going to do an action. What's going to be the reaction to that action? And how do I counter that action? And so just um, thinking further than my first, further than like this right moment. Um, they're able to see like different sides of a problem at the same time and evaluate the pros and cons or one argument versus another and decide on both of them, which one they agree with. Um, they're able to do like if then reasonings. So oh, if this person is tall, they're probably going to block my pass to somebody. So I should throw around them. Right, so being able to, to deduce those things based on what they already know. So you're gonna see again, um, like I said in the beginning, being able to do these things is gonna be the defining factor between the elite athlete and the athlete that was just a really good performer but couldn't really think about his skill. Right, being able to strategize and adapt and improvise um, on the field or on the court is really important for sport performance. So this is a widely and um, widely accepted theory. It's still the predominant theory that's used to explain development, but it had a lot of pitfalls. So he used his own children. And we know that um, if you think about like if your parent was sitting here watching you do this class right now, you'd probably act a little bit different, right? You'd be a little bit more nervous or on edge or you know you want to impress them or you don't and you don't care and you want them to think you don't care whichever way it is um, I, don't, I don't think he really understood um, how it, emotional development affected cognitive development and whether they were motivated to perform right because if they're just like yeah leave me alone then that might not have been clearly what um, his observations may not have been as correct, depending on the state of the kid's emotional health. Um, he didn't consider adulthood, right? So he only he stopped studying kids at 12 years old. So that doesn't really help us um, figure out what's going on in adolescence or later adulthood. Um, and then again, he was just observing. He didn't do any formal experimentation. And so we just have to imagine that this is, um, what happens in most children, but we really, really don't know. It could be just specific to his children. Think about your parents' different parenting styles um, between yours and your friends and how that would affect cognitive development. So um, it's really detailed, it's really systematic, and so that's why we use it. And it's the best study that's been done, even though it has a lot of weaknesses.